one of the cool things about being a pastor is I get to worship before I have to preach. And we've done that this morning. And what a beautiful way we've done it. Brother Ron, I didn't get to say good morning to you this morning. But brother, you said good morning to me in your scripture reading. Thank you for that. Thank you for the music. The last song we sang, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. What a beautiful song. And Karen, I can't punctuate my worship any better than to just say thank you, Lord, for all that you do. I would invite your attention to a couple of passages this morning. Uh, Isaiah 61 and also Luke chapter 4. But before we look at those, I want you to just be reminded of last week. We talked about Arise, Shine. We talked about what eternal life meant and that there's more for us there. So often we get our eyes fixed on here being what heaven should be like. And the reality of it is heaven begins in you as Christ saves you as the Holy Spirit becomes your teacher and He reveals to you things through God's Word that you may be closer to Him. There's nothing in this world that says that this world is going to look anything like heaven. We know that they're going to have to make a new Jerusalem because they've already messed up the old one too bad. That was a joke. I'm glad somebody <laughs> As we look at Isaiah and we see in chapter 60, we see arise, shine, your light is come, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. What a great statement for us to just grab a hold of and say, Amen. 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 Arise, shine, for your light is come, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Isn't that just a great statement that we can say amen to? Amen. amen. <laughs> put on a skirt and have pom-poms up here so you know when to say those kind of things. You know, one of the things I think Baptists are horrible at is listening to what's being said and responding to it in a way that's intelligible. <laughs> Silence is not intelligible. When I look at this passage and I see this, uh, Isaiah 61 then tells us that uh, Jesus is coming. In fact, they were waiting in Jesus' day on a Messiah based upon the passages we're looking at right now. So it's not like I'm misinterpreting this or trying to say, well, this could only mean uh, to Isaiah's time what it could mean to them. It also meant things in Jesus' day, and it means things in our day today. Last week we talked about rise and shine and how important that was for us. Well, we know we're like the children of Israel. We know all the great things. If you claim the name of Jesus Christ and accepted Him as Lord and Savior, you should know all the great things that He's done and is doing in your life. And it ought to give you a compulsion to say, I want to get up and do something about the greatness of my God because of who He is. Amen. Well, 61 now goes, and it defines even clearer for those who have no hope or for those who are, are, have less hope, those who are struggling, those who are in difficult, dire need of rescue. Chapter 61, we find that Jesus is going to come. Now, I know you're saying he's going to read 61 first. No, I'm not. Don't look with me. Look at chapter 4. Keep him coming in 61 because we're going to read them just back to back. Luke chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 21. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. And as soon as we finish Luke, we will then skip over to, or back to, Isaiah 61. Jesus had just been out of the wilderness, and it says that he was back in Galilee. And he comes to his own hometown, and these events take place in his hometown, it says in verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim relief to the captives, a release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. 
He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Isaiah 61, written hundreds of years earlier. In verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who, uh, who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Father, we come before you, and as we see from the Old Testament and the New, these things that come about and these things that are being put together, Lord, we just praise your name that over all of those years, that, Father, this is coming true to the people in Jesus' day. Father, they had the opportunity to walk with him, to hear him, and, Father, they rejected him and crucified him. I pray, Lord, we would be more favorable to hear and to acknowledge the great things that He's done, that we may be able to bring glory to Your name through Your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in His name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. I don't know if you noticed it, but some of those same things that Jesus said are the same things that we have in Isaiah. It's interesting to me that as I study those two things, and Jesus proclaims that, there are, in Isaiah's day, it says that the Spirit revealed this to him. How else would he have known? Do you think Isaiah just made this up? Do you think that Jesus just said, hey, I've got a passage in Isaiah, and I want people to think I'm God's son? You see, everything builds to help us know that when Jesus sat down and said these things, he is who he said he was Amen. and is. Because of that, as we consider this, and we look at chapter uh, 61, it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is what Jesus was saying. If you, if, you, if you look at this in verse 18 of Luke, it says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. All three parts of the Trinity are there. Do you realize that? The Spirit, the Lord, and me. Me being Jesus. This had to be something revealed to Isaiah that was just something probably beyond his comprehension. But to the people in Jesus' day who were expecting Messiah based on what Isaiah had said... They were looking for something that was going to be spiritual, that was of God, and it would be through a person. And you think Isaiah said, I got all that, I understand this completely. I think there was some understanding, but I don't think the fullness of understanding could come until Jesus Christ revealed himself in this passage. You know, it's interesting that when he revealed himself in this passage in Luke, there wasn't people there. Now later they do it, but they don't say, isn't that the little bratty kid? that just tore up the streets and kicked dogs and, and all those other kind of things. Remember all the bad things? Notice they have to equate him out to Joseph, which was common in the day. But then they could also attribute, after they acknowledged the Father, they usually could attribute something to the Son about what they did. Absalom, the son of David, who tried to take his kingdom away from his father, King David. You see, they would always add the attributes of there as well into the picture so that you would know that, that something else was going on. Why would I remember this person? The only reason they remembered this person was because of Joseph. There wasn't anything in his past where they could go back and say, I remember when. You know, some people have a conundrum about the time when Jesus was in the temple and then we don't see him uh, for until he's 30 years old. And what did he do all during then? It's all silent and everything like that. Well, even in his hometown when he said, I am the one who's going to do this. I am the one that this is about. Nobody said it can't be about you because you're, you can't be of God. And I remember all the bad things you did. Right here's a testimony that tells us that Jesus, during that time, that all the people would speculate and say, well, that's why they don't mention anything, because Jesus was out doing all his sowing his oats. He was out doing all those wrong things. The reality of it is, when he got back to his hometown, they didn't have anything to say about him except to acknowledge he was the son of Joseph. That's it. There was nothing else ascribed to him. I don't know about you, but when you were growing up in those quiet years, <laughs> you know and it humbles you because you know you did a lot of stupid things just like I did. 
And just like some of you will do. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying do it. Listen to your parents. Don't do it. But I know that there will be some of you who do exactly what I did. I'm not giving you permission. I'm just telling you that when you do, I hope you don't have bigger regrets. As we look at this, though, there's nothing about Jesus that's spoken here that says he was bad. When he stands up and he declares that he's the Messiah, you can imagine there's some people going, wait a minute. But they still had nothing bad to say about it. I've always thought that was interesting and intriguing to me. When we look at that, we realize that he's saying it's of the Spirit of the Lord. I am the one. You know there had to be some boldness in him. And the, the reality of it is the boldness was from the truth. He was able to say those things because they were truthful. He didn't have to mince words about them or anything. He became the preacher at that moment and said, I'm that person. I'm the one that God has sent. Now that you and I, again going back to chapter 60, your eyes shine. We know that. But for the brokenhearted, for the blind, for those who don't, these words are given to us a little bit more in explanation. He says that he's there to bring good news to the afflicted. He's there to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners. And the final thing, which the Jews would have understood, and we'll talk about later in the message, freedom, or excuse me, um, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Let's think about those things for just a minute that he said that he'd come to do. And he acknowledged himself as doing that. He established himself as the preacher, and his message was good news. Not only in, in Isaiah 60, but in 61, we also have the good news. And we look at it, healing for the brokenhearted. Well, let's take a look. What is it that creates brokenheartedness. Grief. <clears throat> anguish. Distress. Pride. I'll stop there because I think I'm meddling at least in my life I am. Brokenheartedness. What can really cure brokenheartedness? You know, I've, I've seen commercials where they say if you go have some ice cream, it, it helps. <laughs> But as you have learned, by probably your size, it isn't the cure. In fact, if you eat enough of it, you'll find that you are brokenhearted over what your scale says. <laughs> the reality of it, what's out there that can heal the brokenhearted? <coughs> I can't think of anything. I thought for years as I was growing up as a husband and a father, if I had the right tool, it would take care of my distress. Let <laughs> me tell you, some people think that it's a relationship that will help with their brokenheartedness. And guess what? If your relationship is with man, there will be more brokenheartedness. Some people think if they have the right pet, I have to be honest with you, I'm not saying this to be mean, listen to me, people are people and pets are pets, please don't confuse them. Amen. I'm just saying, people are more important than pets, they always have been, God declared it, I don't know that I'm going to try and go back on it, I know that I'm going to get every person who's got a pet, I've got two, I love my wife more than I do my dogs, I'm sorry. I love my kids more than I love my dogs. I love you more than I love my dogs. Well, brokenheartedness can't be cured. Not by the, 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 the schemes of man. You can't get past brokenheartedness. So many people say, I'm so my, I'm in such distress and so depressed. And, and we call it all sorts of things. We call it depression. We call it all. It's brokenheartedness. There's something in your life that hurts. There's some anguish in your life. There's difficulty in your life. I, I wish that I could find someone who's escaped it. No one has. 
You may say, well, those who have lots of money, they can buy their way through. You know, they're just as miserable as the poor people. They just have more money. You may be saying, well, give me some of that so that I can experience it for myself. And the reality of it is, whether you have it or you don't have it, distress and brokenheartedness are still there. Money doesn't cure it. Relationships don't cure it. Can they help us along the way? Yeah, but usually there's more brokenheartedness at the end of it. I've long told you that the reason that I'm not a big fan of pets personally is because I hate it when they die. That's relational, folks. They bring me an awful lot of joy. But when they die, sometimes that death is greater than I want to bear to have another pet again. So as we look at this, we see that brokenheartedness, believe it or not, brokenheartedness, heartedness can kill people. I mean, you take their hope away from them. I know for a fact as a minister, there have been some, and, and they'll lose their spouse. And they've been together for 50, 60, 70 years. And you know what? It's always interesting to me how in that situation they never get past the brokenheartedness and the distress of their passing loved one. And they soon follow them to the grave. But the good news is, he said, I've come to do what? Ha. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. Now, some have said, okay, well, the men of my heart, God, you're wanting God to do it your way. God says, your way doesn't work. And I'm not going to waste my time trying to show you how to do it your way. And oftentimes, he'll leave us to our folly, won't he? We try this and we try that, and at the end of the day, the reality of it is that we've tried a lot of things, but they're still staring, glaring us in the face is still the one who said, I've come to heal the broken heart. Now, before I, I just dismiss everything in this, does God use other people to help us, help us with our broken heartedness? Absolutely, but I've got to tell you something. If those people aren't pointing you to Jesus Christ, they're pointing you to more broken heartedness. So yes, he can use other people to encourage you. But if they're not giving you him, not sharing with you what he's saying, then what good is it because it's the same counsel the world gives and it's empty. That's why we have to, when we have the opportunity, not just share a good uh, psychological thought with people, not share what Freud had to say about it, not share what others have to say. What are we telling them about what God has to say about it? Because he's the one that heals the broken heart. Haven't you found that to be true in your life as well? Yeah. He's the one that did it. And at the end of the day, you can, you can thank all of those that were part of it, but the reality of it is that God and God alone, through His Son, Jesus Christ, mended the broken heart. Well, it's sad because brokenheartedness and, and this distress comes upon us. Why? Because we're not looking for who can really heal us. We're not looking for the one who can actually do the work. So I would encourage you, if you're brokenhearted, if there's things going on in your life and you just seem to be so uh, let down and so depressed and so uh, almost irreparable, i got to tell you that God says, I sent my son and he'll mend that. He can heal that. But it's when I look to Him. One of the most intriguing questions in the Bible that I've ever seen, and, and if you look at John chapter 5, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to just tell you. The, the man that was crippled laying beside the, the pool of Bethesda, and as Jesus came by, Jesus says, Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? So Christian, I would say, if you want to stay in your brokenheartedness and you want to do that, then, then there's nothing that anyone can do to fix you or to save you because you'll keep trying the world's things. This is why I say you can't fix people. God fixes people. <clears throat> and because of that, when I realize that, the best thing I can do for you is pray for you to encourage you in God and through His Word. 
But you have to choose to let him heal you. On many occasions, I've told you I don't like doctors. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't, I don't like going to doctors, and many of you are that way. Some of you are like, hey, what's so bad about doctors? You're, that's fine. I'm good with that. I don't like to go to doctors. And I realize, and this is my pride, I'm confessing to you right now. This is my pride. I want to think that I'm okay. And there's nothing wrong in my body. As I get older, I realize there are some things that aren't doing what they're supposed to do, but nothing's wrong with me. Much. <laughs> Unless you ask my wife. <laughs> Do you want to be healed? You got to be willing to go to where the healing is. And if you're not willing to do that, then you will stay stuck in that brokenhearted, depressed situation. You see, my problem with doctors is I don't like to surrender. I don't like to surrender. But I would almost venture a guess that there are many of you out there today that don't like to surrender either. Yeah. Whether it's to doctors or to authority or whatever the case may be, whatever your cup of tea is in that. Maybe it's a wife to her husband, a husband to the Lord. We don't like to surrender. And if you don't believe that, Tell somebody when they're talking about something that they're wrong. Watch how fast they defend themselves because they don't want to submit to somebody else's thought. You know, one of the things I found about brokenheartedness until I'm willing to surrender to the person that can do something about it, to the God who's provided a way for me in the wilderness until I'm willing to surrender that. And I'm constantly reminded in these things of life, like doctors and other situations like that, I'm constantly reminded, and if I'm having a hard time surrendering to my doctor, how much harder time am I going to have surrendering to my doctor? Strongholds. Oftentimes lead us to that brokenheartedness because we're counting on the things of this world to get us through. And God says it's not about the things of this world. The things of this world will kill you. In fact, you're already condemned to die already. The Bible tells us that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this world has no answer for us except through Jesus Christ that God provided. And we have to surrender ourselves to that and understand that it's by Him that the healing is comes and the brokenheartedness can be overcome. It doesn't mean that those things go away, but it gives you a perspective about a God who can do all things. It gives you a perspective that tells you that greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Amen. Thank you, Nicole. Amen. I hope you all were paying attention. Hmm. I told you I got to worship before I got to preach this <coughs> message. This is awesome. <laughs> You see, we have to surrender to Him. We have to confess our sin to Him. And notice I don't have to confess to everybody, although it tells us to confess our sins one to another. I'm talking about those things that you know nothing about in my life and the things I know nothing about in your life, those evil thoughts that you have, those things where you try and gain power uh, by covertly uh, monitoring your words and making sure that things go the way you want them to do. Please don't tell me that you don't do that. The Bible says we all do that kind of stuff. It's called manipulation. You ever do that? How many of you ever manipulated somebody? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. That's what. You know what's cool about that? I just asked that. And a child in the back raised his hand. And some of you adults said, well, I, I don't do that. I appreciate the honesty of a child. We all do we got to confess our sin and, and acknowledge that we are sinful, that we do things wrong. Once, once we had saved all the time, we just go, hey, we're forgiven. But the reality of it is, do you still do things that are wrong? Yes. Confessing our sins is to surrender those to a Savior who can forgive them. Have you ever been able to forgive your own sins? You ever noticed that? 
You can't do it. And oftentimes, even after you've asked God to do it, you won't do it. You've got to be willing to confess. I've sinned to him. James 4, 8 says, Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Take an honest assessment of your heart and what role that you may have had in the demise of a certain relationship. Own up to it. First John tells us, in fact, this is why I'm... I'm remember the passage Brother Ron read? First John? Yeah, okay. Well, you can, you can, I hope you stuck your thumb in that because I'm using that one right now too. So I'm telling you, I've already had a chance to worship this one. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Huh. You see, when we confess our sins, we're acknowledging that we can't do anything about them except to give them to a loving God who's forgiven them through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the high priest part of it. That's awesome. Some of the things that you'll see when we understand that more and when we start applying that authority and allowing Him to, to do those things and, and we confess our sins, we'll find that we stop slandering other people. You know why? Because we don't have to make ourselves feel better by making someone else look bad. You see, when we're brokenhearted, oftentimes we want everyone else to hurt with us. Do we not? We want everyone else to acknowledge our pain and acknowledge the things that are going on. You know what? The Lord has acknowledged that. The Lord has acknowledged that. He understands what you're going through. We don't need to drag other people down into it, do we? Wouldn't it be great if when somebody's downhearted, you could give them a word from God and, and say, hey, you know what? Cheer up. God's on our side. Wouldn't it be great if they said, you know, you're absolutely right. Praise God. I wasn't thinking about it like that. In one of the episodes of MASH, BJ gets a, you know, the, the show is kind of an icon. Um, one of the episodes of MASH, BJ gets a letter from his wife that says she's, have, she's going to have to go to work. And he's so distraught over that and so angry about it that he's starting to try and, and win poker games and, and uh, pinball games and everything like that. And he's angry and bitter and, and everything like that. And, and he's standing there and, and, a, and Margaret walks in and, and Hawkeye and, and they're trying to console him a little bit and everything like that. And they, he just won't accept their consolation won't accept anything they have to say. And he says, you just don't understand what kind of situation I'm in. I've lost a lot by not being able to be there. And she looks at him and she says, maybe it's because you have the most. Maybe it's because you have the most to lose. Some of us don't have that. And with that, he makes a comment about humbling himself realizing that there's others around him that are going through difficulty. When I consider that, I see a lot of times that people, when they finally get the good news about God, they go, yeah, why am I not happy? I know where I'll spend eternity. I know that my God is not just there when I need Him. He's walking with me. And believe it or not, even when you're in your most desperate situation, He's present. I'm not saying He's there when you call Him. I'm saying He's present in you through His Spirit and through His Son. He's already there. The second thing that we do as a result of understanding this healing of the troubled heart, we start to give out more grace. <coughs> we start to exhibit some of the very things that have been lavished on us through a God that loves us. And it helps us to see how we ought to be lavishing that on others and showing them the grace that oftentimes the world can afford them. You know, I, I have a, I have, you know that I'm a, a traffic guy. I, I just, oh, traffic just curious. If you're somebody who does it, stop you're waiting in line for a light 
and somebody's over in this lane wanting to turn, or wanting to turn left. And there's multiple lanes there. And people think, I'll do a good deed, and I'll stop, let the light turn green, all the other cars, while I wait for these other two lanes of traffic to, to stop, and they don't. And this person finally just pulls out inches there, and you're sitting there going, I could have made three lights ago to my house. Why am I sitting here? Believe it or not, that's against the law. Just telling you, I want to just give you a little bit. It's against the law to have them do that. Because if there's another car coming in the other lane and it hits them, you're responsible. You think it's a good deed, but it's not. Well, I share that with you because grace instead of judgment is hard for me. And people think that they're exhibiting grace by doing that. That may be the only good deed they do, but they're doing it illegally. I just want you to know that. It troubles me. <clears throat> but you know, there's bigger issues. There's bigger issues. And where I could give a little bit of grace, and where people want to exercise grace in this world, often is misapplied. But with Christians, we ought to know how to apply grace because it's been applied to us. We ought to know what it means to be merciful because mercy has been shed upon us. The reason I shared that story with you a moment ago was not to just share with you my pet peeve, but was to share with you that that's not grace when they do that. That's not mercy when they do that. That's stupid when they do that. And oftentimes we think we're sharing grace with the world when our actions and the things that we do aren't the way they ought to be. And it's not in according, uh, according to the things that God has said. <clears throat> be sure that the grace that you lavish is the grace that you understand and are grateful for in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, everybody wants to try quiet on that one. Second thing that it says that he does is gives liberty for the captives. Um, what are some of the things that we're captive to in this world today? You may be saying, well, we're not captive to anybody, anything. Um, anybody pay taxes? Just check it. You don't think that you're captive to something? Stop paying your property tax. <laughs> Stop paying your federal income tax. They have a nice room for you. <laughs> we are captive. But you know, we talk about things with money and, and, and stuff like that and taxes and all sorts of things. But we're also captive to death. We're all appointed to die to die. And that means we have to deal with that. And sometimes that just perplexes people so much. They're so afraid of dying. But when Jesus comes on the scene, we have no need to be fearful of death anymore. When he comes on the scene, death is no longer something that has hold on us that can cause us not to celebrate the greatness of our God because He gives us everlasting life. Hmm. We're in bondage and in captivity to the actions of others. Do you realize what other people do have an effect on us? You don't believe that? Just turn over on your cable TV to the Congress channel. <laughs> they will show you how some of the dumbest things can affect us and some of the smartest things as well what about health some of you are bound to a health condition that you'll carry the rest of your life some of you may have had it all of your life there's captivity in that is there not keeps you from doing some of the things. You may be saying, okay, so he, he releases us and the captives go free. So in other words, I don't have to worry about that anymore. No, no, no. Here's the thing. You'll live with it the rest of your life, but you can live with it to the glory of God for the rest of your life. Amen. you got hope in all this. <coughs> what about wrong choices? Y'all made any wrong choices in your life? We talked about that earlier. Uh -huh. Are we not captive to some of those? Yeah. He says liberty for that. It doesn't mean that they go away. What it means is it gives you a different perspective, understanding that he will see you through and that he's the one that releases you. This world 
there's no place that says this world is going to release you from all your bad mistakes. <laughs> it's going to release you from, you know, we talk about freedom and liberty and all those other kind of things. But the reality of it is, you're in bondage, just like I am. And if you've made the mistake, you're also in bondage to creditors. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that when we talk about slavery and captivity and stuff like that, we, we demand it at certain parts in history, but the reality of it is we're still in bondage. And as long as we're here, <coughs> there will be things that captivate us. There will be things that capture us. There will be things that we think about that distress us. You know, my past choices can be forgiven. It doesn't mean that the consequences go away, but I know that I can stand before the Father forgiven. Do you realize that? Most of the time, the things people in captivity do is because they have no way of getting rid of them. The Bible gives us a way to do that through Jesus Christ. And it says if we say, we, we can't, or we have no sin, the Bible says we're a liar and the truth's not in us. Well, he has proclaimed liberty to the captives. He only has the right and power to make such a proclamation. Who are the captives? Those who are enthralled by influences that delude and destroy. You see, souls are in bondage because of sin. And he liberates us. You may be saying, yeah, but I want to liberate you from all those things you just mentioned. The reality of it is he liberates us for all of eternity. Because when this world comes to an end, when this life on this world comes to an end, He liberates us. And we have hope beyond this place. Most people are having to live their life as fast and as furious as they can right now. You know why? That's how. It's all they know. And they think that it's going to be helpful. And it's not. There are two other things, and I'll touch on them a little bit more tonight, but I want you to see, uh, He says, <coughs> for the blind, opening the eyes of those who are bound. A new vision of spiritual things. Can we agree that when we accept Jesus Christ as we study His Word, we see things in a new way? We see things from a different perspective now? And as we see those things from a different perspective, we go, thank you, Lord, because we know that it was His Spirit that changed us because we listened to what He had to say. And He gives us things where we never thought about it like that before. How many times have you been studying God's Word and you come across a passage that you've read probably a hundred times? You've heard the story from your Sunday school teacher and all of a sudden there's some new illumination to that passage for your life. And you're like, wow. The Spirit's trying to teach you something. The last thing that's mentioned, and this is the one that oftentimes is is misused the most. Grace for all. Grace for all. I have to, I have to say about this one, a lot of people say, well, that means everybody's going to heaven. Grace for all. Grace for all. <coughs> Please understand the simplicity of this. Grace for all who accept. Grace for all who are willing to follow Him. Grace to all who are willing to surrender themselves and say, you're the one, not me. This is why in Isaiah, you see, I think there's three different times you'll find the potter and the clay illustration. That grace is available because he's a loving, caring God. That grace is available for those who choose to receive him, recognizing he'll heal the broken heart. He'll sit free. And he'll be the one that gives me sight. There's one thing, and I, I, I close with this, there's one thing that is not in Jesus' statement. He quotes Isaiah, but he doesn't finish the quote. Isaiah says, <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed to me uh, anointing me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance. 
says it right there. Vengeance of our God. You notice Jesus stopped there. Because his message was not about people coming to God because of the vengeance. It was about people coming to God because of his grace and his mercy and his provision through the Son of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't come to tell us about the vengeance. But Isaiah says that's coming. Jesus only stopped short of that, not because God's not going to do it, but because he was there to tell them of the greatness of what they had in their midst right then. And I would say to you today that as long as he tarries, as long as the vengeance of God doesn't come through and the, the uh, rapture and, and the judgment and all those things that we find in Revelation... As long as he tarries, those words are there. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captive free. Give liberty. And open our eyes. There will be a day, though, because Isaiah said it. You've got you to know if Isaiah said it was accurate about Jesus Christ. You've got to know it's going to be accurate about the things of God. And he says, and the vengeance of the Lord. That's coming, folks. Not because he's a vengeful God. There will be a day that God says, that's it. And while we live in this time of grace and have the opportunity to receive him, why wouldn't we want to? If you don't know Jesus Christ today, why wouldn't you want to accept him? Christian, why would you want to stay in the very things that when you accepted Jesus Christ, he said, I bring freedom for those things. That you don't have to walk around with a conscience like that anymore. That you don't have to walk around in bondage because of who I am and what I want to do. Isn't that a great message? Wow. Are we living with the idea of a rise shine for the light has come? And we understand the light has come because he's healed our broken heart. He's given us hope beyond this life. He set us free from all the things in this world that would grab us and say no. He's the one that liberates. And as Christians, I don't know why we would want to share that great news with people. How many of you have seen somebody this week that's brokenhearted or in captivity? something in their life. How many of us have seen those who are just inundated because they can't see the truth about God? Why wouldn't you want to tell them? Why wouldn't you want to talk to them about Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't you want to say, hey, He came to do these things? Why wouldn't we want to tell them? And shout Nicole said, offer him a piece of gum and Jesus. <laughs> what better illustration? Show you how a piece of my gum, let me tell you about Jesus. I hope and pray that this would cause you to say, I want to tell people more about the greatness of the God. And the one who loves me so much. He died for me. I want to follow. And I want to tell other people about it. You don't know Jesus. Everything I've said this morning is a great reason. If it made sense to you, that's because the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and God's compelling. Don't miss your opportunity. Would you stand with me? Father,